First Baptist family, it is my privilege to welcome you today to Resurrection Sunday. The day that we celebrate that the tomb is empty, ironically or providentially, so is this sanctuary. As we continue to navigate these days of a global pandemic and social distancing, thank you again for allowing us the privilege to be in your home, on your back porch, maybe you're driving down the the road in your car, however you find yourself today, thank you for allowing us to join you as we celebrate today Resurrection Sunday. Now, if this were in times past, we would gather on this campus, there would be thousands of people, there'd be an incredible parking problem, and there would be some things that you would expect to see or hear. You'd expect to see me in a seersucker suit, and I'm in that seersucker suit today, an incredible organ of prelude that we'll play in just a moment, and of course, the benediction of the Hallelujah Course. Those are just the things we have come to expect on Resurrection Sunday here at First Baptist Church of Opelika. But there's one very special thing that typically happens on Easter Sunday, and we are grateful today to allow you the privilege of observing believers' baptism. So at this time, I'm going to toss it to Paul Dunbar in the baptistry as we have an exciting declaration of faith on this Easter Resurrection Sunday. Good morning. I am Pastor Paul, the kids' pastor at FBC Opelika, and we are humbled to be able to join you today. And I want to tell you this really, really cool story. Brian, come on down here, buddy. I get a phone call on Thursday, Wednesday, from a dad, and he says, hey, can we talk about Brian? He accepted Jesus on Sunday after the kids' service online. And I thought, man, are you serious? And I said, well, let's FaceTime because this day and age we cannot have a meeting. So we FaceTimed in this big old smile. Come here, Brian. Show everybody that smile. Right here. I said, Brian, do you understand what Jesus did? You know, this weekend we're celebrating his resurrection. And you understand that this water is just a symbol of what Jesus did for us. It's not tied to your salvation. And he was like, yes, sir. And I said, do you understand that you're a sinner? And he's like, yes, sir. And I I said, do you understand that you need Jesus in your life? And he said, yes, sir. And so we are super excited. Bryant, have you accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes, sir. All right, buddy, come right here. Cross your arms. Bryant, as my new brother in Christ, it gives me great pleasure on this Resurrection Sunday to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in new life. Yes, so as a family today, let's have a great time and worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords.
The Bible says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, to present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Would you allow us the privilege of praying with you and for you by calling the number on the screen below. God bless. Well, good morning on this happy Easter morn. On this Resurrection Sunday, we gathered, scattered as a nation, as a people, and even as a church, that we have one thing in common, one faith, one Lord, and one baptism. So I invite you this morning that wherever you may be, wherever you may be gathered, that we would continue to gather as a church in your living rooms, in your dining rooms, you'd gather as a family, that we would lift our voices, we would lift our hearts, that we would sing, he is risen. Christ the Lord is risen today. Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. Sons of men and angels say, Hallelujah. Raise your joys and triumphs high. i 
I believe that this life, with its great mysteries, surely someday will come to an end. Oh, but That the Christ who was slain on the cross has the power to change lives today. First Baptist family, as we gather on this very special, shall I say, the most special of days. This is what we call commonly Resurrection Sunday or Easter Sunday. And I'm sure for many of you, as for myself, we are celebrating today in a very different manner than usual. In fact, as I look back on my life, I've celebrated this day in a host of different means. I've been in very small, what we might call country churches. I've been in large stadiums for community services. I've even had the privilege of being offside of a traditional church campus and at a, at a park, an international horse park for a large gathering. But this is the very first time that I've ever celebrated this day in an empty worship center, an empty sanctuary. And for most of us, if not all of us, we're looking at almost every aspect of our lives and we're somewhat reevaluating. At least we're taking a step back and we've been given a little bit of perspective and, and looking at what we did and how we did it and in particular, why. This is one of those days where 
We traditionally gather with our families for incredible meals. We come by the thousands to church campuses. Oftentimes, uh, we will go out and, and spend uh, an amount of money on new clothes. We'll take pictures as families. We'll post them on social media to celebrate this day. None of those normal activities are going to take place today. Most likely, you're not having a large family gathering. At least we've been encouraged not to. There are not thousands of people on this campus, and I'm sure very few family portraits from today will go online. And yet today, you're in your living room, your dining room, your back porch, driving down the road, and you saw fit the need to tune in, the need to be a part of this significant day. Which leads me to ask a very important question. If we don't have the large gatherings, and if we don't have the incredible choral anthems, and if we're not taking family photos on this day, then why is this day such a big deal? Now, I don't want to get the proverbial cart before the horse, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Lord tells us that if Jesus Christ is not risen from the dead, then our faith is in vain. You realize that the only reason that we sing The only reason that we gather, the only reason that we celebrate this day is because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And today all of the trappings and all the culture of what we call commonly Easter have somewhat gone by the wayside. And it forces us to do a little bit of introspection of why is today so important. I want to answer that question from the Gospel of John chapter 3. Now, for those of you who are well-versed in Scripture, you know uh, that the Gospel of John has a whole lot more chapters than three. And this is not an account of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And and so I want to address the question why today is so important for us, not simply from the facts and the figures of the resurrection. In fact, uh, that same chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, says not only did the apostles witness Jesus' resurrection, but over 500 individuals at one time. Today's not a day to analyze the facts. They are what they are. Today is to address the question from our perspective. Why is this day important to us? Or should I say, why should this day be so important to us? John chapter 3. The Gospel of John. Hopefully you have a copy of God's Word. Maybe there's one copy for your entire family around the table. or, Or maybe each of you have your own. We find ourselves maybe in one of the most famous chapters of the Bible, but most definitively... In a moment, we're going to read probably the most famous verse in all of the Bible. That famous John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That verse that we see oftentimes displayed on t-shirts and on signs and posters at sporting events, and rightfully so. Today, we're going to look at the context. We're going to look at the conversation that Jesus is having with a man by the name of Nicodemus. And more importantly, we're going to see that immediately surrounding that very famous verse 16, Jesus makes a declaration that the forgiveness of our sin, the salvation of our souls, will be attainable and can be accomplished because of what he is going to do on humanity's behalf. Today, as we look at the question of why today is so important. I want to see it from the perspective of Nicodemus. I want to see it from the perspective of humanity. If you'll allow me to challenge you, sit back and and as we study scripture together today, even though it's in a virtual environment, I want you to walk through the response of Nicodemus. I want you to see what Jesus says to him, and it's my hope and desire today that you will see yourself in the life and in the setting of this story today. In John chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, one of the most famous chapters in all the Bible, says there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night. He said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, that which is born of spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. 
The wind bloweth where it listeth, and you hear the sound thereof, but you cannot tell whence it come and whether it goes, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Verse 9, Nicodemus answered. He said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that which we know, and testify we have seen, and you receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. Now as you walk through this story, this famous story of Jesus and an interaction with a man named Nicodemus, if you'll allow me on this very special celebratory day uh, to do somewhat of a bit of humor, uh, some of you might look at this story and say, this is the story of Nick at night. Why? Because in the beginning, Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night. And I want to begin today by looking at the story in reference to the who. Who is this individual? Not so much the details of his life, but who does he represent? He represents you. He represents myself. He represents all of humanity in his interaction with Jesus Christ. I think the first thing that we need to see about Nicodemus and potentially about you as well, is that he was a man of curiosity. Notice what it says. He came to Jesus by night. Now, there are many that have said, and I think rightfully so, that he would have been nervous. He would have been somewhat fearful to have a personal one-on-one -on -one conversation with this rogue rabbi, Jesus of Nazareth. Why? Because Nicodemus was in the proverbial upper crust of his culture and society says that he was a Pharisee. He was one of the religious elites. Notice what Jesus calls him, a master of Israel. Now that's one of those interesting statements that's not found anywhere else, not only in the Bible, but even the history of, of Judaism. And many have believed that what Jesus was sharing with him is that he recognized that he was, shall we say, the, the top theologian of his day. Which is interesting because what did Nicodemus say? We know you've come from God. Nobody could do these things unless he was from God. And so there might have been a little bit of a concern. I mean, after all, a few chapters later in chapter 7, these same Pharisees, his peers, shall we say, uh, they began to be critical of Jesus. And Nicodemus actually defends Jesus. And they kind of push back a little bit. But I think the main thing that we see in Nicodemus' life is he was curious. When the Bible says he came at night, there was some significance in the culture then that you and I don't possess as much today. Back in those days, as the day drew to a close, as the children began to go to bed, and as, as the families began to, quote, shut down the home, the men of prominence, the men of intrigue of the community, would make their way to the housetops in the cool moonlight. They would discuss philosophy, politics, and yes, you guessed it, religion. See, it was on the housetops of Jesus' day were oftentimes the most significant and serious of questions would be had. And so here comes Nicodemus. He approaches Jesus at night. Here they are on the rooftop, and they begin to discuss the matters of eternity. The number one topic, not just of humanity, but of Nicodemus' personal life. The very fact that Jesus recognizes him as such a great theologian and prominent person. I'm sure his curiosity was struck. Was this the same person? That two decades ago, as a young 12-year-old, on the, the week of Passover, came to the Temple Mount and confounded the scholars of the day. Is this the one who asked questions we couldn't answer, and he had answers for questions that we had? But his curiosity would have really been, shall we say, heightened if you just look at the days previous to this encounter. In chapter 2 of the Gospel of John, Jesus performs his first public miracle. Here he is at a wedding feast, and as you study the passage, there was an enormous amount of water in these huge containers that when Jesus spoke, it turned into wine. 
Now, I know they didn't have social media back then and all the platforms and text messaging and such as we do today. But I can assure you that word got out that there was this man from Nazareth, this rogue rabbi of sorts, who transformed an entire wedding celebration and turned a massive amount of one thing into a completely different form. But there was another activity that took place in chapter 2. Here in the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he walks into that famous temple mount. It's the time of celebrating the Passover. It's the time to remember what God did on behalf of the Jewish people. What does Jesus do? It says that he gets a a cord of leather and he, he creates a whip and he begins to come through the temple, overturning the tables, casting out the money changers and setting the sacrifices free. Nicodemus probably was curious, is this the same one of two decades ago? This man who can turn water into wine, this one who can overturn the tables. I know he's from God. I just don't know the details. I know that you're curious today. You say, well, how do you know that I'm curious? Because you're actually watching, you're actually listening today. It is Resurrection Sunday, and in a virtual environment, let's be honest, you could be anywhere you want to be today. But you're watching your smartphone, your television, you're listening to the radio. However you're hearing or watching this service, you're curious, just like Nicodemus was, what's so important about this Jesus guy? But the thing that may relate more to you and others is the fact that he was confused. He and Jesus begin this dialogue, and twice Jesus tells him that he must be born again. Not that it's a good idea or not that he makes a suggestion, but it must take place in his life. I want you to notice what happens in verse 9. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, how can these things be? Now that's a phenomenal response. Here's a Pharisee, a religious leader. Here's a man who is a, a theologian of theologians. And he cannot comprehend the basic statement that he needs to be born again. Now let me unpack all that Jesus was sharing there and why he was so confused. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 18 says, Know you not that we are redeemed not by corruptible things such as silver or gold or the vain conversations of the traditions of our fathers, but by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. See, Nicodemus fell into the same trap that oftentimes we do as just representatives of humanity. Believing that there are items that secure our relationship with the Lord or secure our eternity with the Lord that are just not, shall we say, biblically found. Let me take that verse 18 of 1 Peter chapter 1 and kind of extrapolate on that for a moment. We are not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold. Nicodemus would have been a man of great wealth to hold the position that he had. And I think sometimes we think, well, if my life is going well, if I am prosperous, if I'm successful, if I've attained certain goals in life, then I must be right with God. You know, it's interesting that perspective is somewhat being shattered in our culture today. For all the goals and all the aspirations that many of us have had over the years are beginning to crumble. And we're realizing how frail and fragile the material world is. On the other side of, shall I say, the coin with this illustration, there are those who have an understanding or thought that if they give away, if they contribute a lot of their resources, their income, uh, the goods of this life, that somehow that uh, atones for all the bad. That if they're willing to be selfless, if they're willing to be generous, if they're willing to be altruistic, then somehow that makes them right with God and deems them worthy of a place the Bible calls heaven. Nicodemus would have grown up in an environment that would have fostered that. In fact, in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus kind of gives a backhanded compliment to the Pharisees. He says, you don't just give the tithe of 10%, but he goes on to say, you give above and beyond that. You're completely generous with your finances. And maybe you're just like Nicodemus. You say, well, I've been generous. I'm helping those right now who are struggling in this global economic pandemic. And maybe you think, well, because I'm helping my neighbor or I'm helping my employees or I'm helping others, somehow that must mean I'm right with God. What did Jesus tell him? No, you must be born again. Now, 1 Peter 1.18 also says, by the vain conversations of life. That's just one of those statements of the deeds of life. 
And this is an easy trap to get into. Somehow we think that if we do a certain amount of good that outweighs a certain amount of bad, then when God takes the scales of our life, it's all going to be good. Well, when you get to the book of Revelation chapter 20, there's actually a group of people who come before the Lord, and it says the books of their works were opened, and none of them were found worthy. You know, Nicodemus probably lived a pretty clean life. He probably is the kind of guy that you'd like to be neighbors with, live in his neighborhood. You'd like to say that he was a reference on your resume for a whole lot of different reasons. He probably did a whole lot of good, and hear me clearly, he probably didn't do a whole lot of what we classify as bad. Nicodemus was one of those guys where he could have easily said, just look at my life. The good outweighs the bad, the bad wasn't that bad, and the good has been really good. What did Jesus say? You must be born again. But then there's that last statement in verse 18 of 1 Peter 1. It talks about the tradition of the fathers. Well, if anybody had tradition, it would have been Nicodemus. Uh, most likely not only his own earthly father, but his grandfather and such would have continued the tradition. If you'll allow me just to kind of do a little bit of a sidebar here. Historically speaking, there is a great, shall we say, amount of research that says Nicodemus's official name was Nicodemus ben Gurion. That's right, for those of you who've been to the nation of Israel, that's actually the name of the airport over there. And so therefore, there's an incredible amount of evidence for the tradition that his family would have held. He would have thought, well, surely, because I can go all the way back to Father Abraham, I must be good. How many of us have gotten caught up in the trap and say, well, one day, when I get to heaven, I'm going to tell God, don't worry, I was a Baptist, got it covered. How many times do we say, well, my grandfather was a pastor, my dad was a deacon, my mom was a Sunday school teacher, this and that. See, it's easy to get caught up in the trap of thinking it's the amount that we give or the amount that we make, the good that we do or the bad that we don't, or looking at our family and our heritage and our tradition and saying, what an example of, quote, righteousness. What did Jesus tell him? You must be born again. And so like you, Nicodemus was curious, but you might be confused because what I just shared with you may be completely contrary to what you grew up with or what you may have believed before this service. Jesus said it's not about what you make or give away. It's not about what you do or don't do. It's not about who you know or don't know. It's have you been born again. But it's this third aspect about Nicodemus that I want to uh, draw to uh, your attention. He was convicted. Notice he says, how can these things be? He's confused. Then Jesus begins to speak and Nicodemus never responds. You say, well, how do you know he was convicted? Well, you could look later on in the Gospel of John and see how Nicodemus later interacts uh, with the person of Jesus Christ. But allow me to share you the view from the pulpit. You know, I tease all the time. That's one of the many books that I'd like to write one day. I'm going to have an entire chapter about going through this global pandemic. I tease all the time about seeing couples fuss and fight and kids being disciplined and people sleeping and such. Uh, but now I have a view of very different. It's a completely empty view. But can I share with you one of the views that I most appreciate as a pastor? Is when I see the top of your head. You say, the top of my head, why is that? Well, some of you are, are very uh, much note takers. I mean, you've got a journal out and your Bible out and you're writing, you're taking notes. And when your head is down, that means you're, you're scribbling and getting everything down. But those of you who may or may not be, when your head is down, oftentimes it is a sign that you are convicted. You know, those who begin to shout the amens and the hallelujahs in a service, don't get me wrong, I love when that happens. And I kind of miss it in these days. But when someone shouts amen when a pastor is preaching, they're saying, I agree with you. If I can use southern terms, they're saying, get them, pastor, get them. But when your head is hanging, you realize that the message is for you. You realize that God is taking his scripture and the scalpel of his Holy Spirit, and he's applying it to your own heart. We see that in the life of Nicodemus. And that's my hope for you today. As we read this famous section in the Bible, you see Nicodemus' response. I don't think necessarily in an environment such as this, your head has to be hanging. But maybe where you are today, maybe you're all alone, maybe even gathered with your family. Maybe the Holy Spirit of God is convicting you like Nicodemus. If that's the case, I want you to hear 
what Jesus says to him. And it's that word, what, that is so important. Beginning in verse 13 of this chapter, Jesus begins to describe to him, Jesus begins to share with him some very significant information. And so today, if you're curious, you're watching, you must be, there's the possibility that you're confused. I'm hopeful that you're convicted. That whatever you thought established a right relationship with God or whatever you thought would earn you somehow admittance into heaven, I hope you're convicted that that may not be the right answer. So the next question would be, then what is the right answer? I want you to notice what Jesus says to him, beginning in verse 13. No man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And the thing that I want you to grasp there is Jesus is telling Nicodemus, he's telling you and he's telling myself, that we've got to be convinced that Jesus Christ is the only solution to our sin problem. Now, he mentions Moses there, and he's going back later with the serpent to the book of Numbers. But even Moses, in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 18, said that the Messiah, whom we know as Jesus Christ, would walk in his footsteps. He prophesied that his ministry would look like his in some respects. That's why 1 Corinthians chapter 10 says that when Jesus Christ came and he delivered us from our sins, it pictured as Moses delivered the Israelites out of the bondage of Egypt. There's a picture there. There's a similitude. He would come in the manner of. We've got to be convinced that there's no solution to our sin problem other than Jesus. Even Moses the recipient of the Ten Commandments, even Moses, the deliverer of Israel, said that he was not the answer. You know, this same Moses would not even step to that famous promised land. His own sin, his own rebellion kept him on the other side. That's why he declared that a Messiah was necessary for his life, a Messiah is necessary for your life, and a Messiah is necessary for my life. It says that Moses here uh, prophesied and predicted, convinced that even as the serpent was put on the pole. Now that's a story found all the way back in the book of Numbers. The Israelites had rebelled, they had sinned against God. And so they put a serpent up on a pole and when they looked on the serpent, they were healed. If they did not, they were not. What is Jesus telling Nicodemus? You can have all the good works in the world, you can have all the money in the world, you can have all the networking connections in the world, but if you want to be healed of your sin problem, if you want to be set free from the bondage of sin, then you need to look to me. He was telling Nicodemus, you've got to be convinced that the only way of forgiveness and the only way of salvation is through Jesus Christ. But the other thing he was saying is he needed to be converted. Now in verse 16, that famous verse, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I use the word convert or to be converted. And sometimes I think that word has some kind of ill definition or aura to it. But I want you to think of a very simple description with me. If you've ever had the privilege, as my wife and I have, uh, to travel overseas, you'll discover that your phone charger, your hair dryer, whatever electronic device that you prefer cannot just be plugged into the wall across the ocean. In fact, what we use is 110, they use 220, and so you actually have to take with you a converter. Now, what does that device do? It plugs into the wall so that the source that is coming from the wall can be changed to match the source that your device needs. That's why 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 says there's only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. What is Jesus saying in this famous verse 16? He's saying that the only way to go from death to life is through me. And if you're here today and you're trusting eternity on your good works, it's never going to convert. If you're trusting your amount of good deeds or, or the money you give away, it'll never convert. Why? Because the Bible says we've all fallen short. What Jesus is saying is you need to be converted. You need to have somebody, he was speaking of himself, change who you are. Not based on what you've done, Nicodemus, but based on what I'm going to do for you. That's why we celebrate this Resurrection Sunday. So what does verse 16 tell us today? 
first thing it says is this, that God loves you. You know, I've heard people say before, if you knew what I've done, where I've been, and the things I've thought, there's no way that God truly could love me. I want you to notice what it says, for God so loved the world. You know what that means? Even you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, if you'll kind of read between the lines there with me, we've already seen him exposed to Nicodemus that he had a sin problem and couldn't solve it himself. But what we discover is that our sin, our rebellion, our iniquity, our trespassing has isolated us from a holy God. In fact, it's created a chasm. God is holy. He's nothing but holy. And we're very much the opposite. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22 says, Without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins. Jesus Christ had to come and give of himself, shed his blood so our sins could be forgiven. So for God so loved the world, he loves you, but he had to shed his blood because of your sin problem and my sin problem and humanity's sin problem. The next thing I want you to notice in this conversion is he wants to forgive you. That whosoever believeth will not perish but have eternal life. Whoever believes, not just a simple mental assertion or acknowledgement. What he's telling Nicodemus, what he's telling you, what he's telling me is that if we are willing to admit we have a sin problem, if we're willing to admit there's no way to solve it ourselves and to believe and be convinced that Jesus Christ alone is the one who can take care of our sin problem, he will forgive us, and notice that last statement, everlasting life. Now for those of you who are note takers at home or on the back porch, you may have noticed a little acronym there. God loves you. You're isolated because of sin. He wants to forgive you and give you everlasting life. See, that's the conversion. According to the book of Ephesians chapter 2 and a whole lot of other places, you and I are dead in our trespasses and sin. But what does Jesus Christ come to give us? He wants to convert our death into life. He loves you. Even though you've isolated yourself from him in sin, he wants to forgive you and give you everlasting life. Now that being said, I want to get to the most important question. It's actually found, the answer, in verse 17. You know, when we quote John 3, 16, and when we see it, we, we know what it says, and most of you actually probably know what it means. But verse 17 may be one of the most neglected verses in all of the Bible. We see who Nicodemus is. He's a picture of all of us. We see what Jesus tells him. He needs to be convinced and he needs to be converted. But the big question today is why? Not just why is today important that the tomb is empty, but why do you and I need a Savior? Why do we need to trust Jesus? Why is the whole gospel story, why is the Resurrection Sunday so critical for our lives? I want you to notice what verse 17 says. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. If you continue through the rest of chapter 3 of the Gospel of John, that word condemnation comes up in a regular form. In fact, the very last verse of John chapter 3 basically says that we are condemned already, those of us who do not believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Now I know that today is a day of celebration. Today is a day that we typically would gather in large groups and there's smiles on our faces and there's bright clothes upon our bodies. This is one of those days that is known to be cheerful and happy. But if you allow me a few moments, I want to deal with a little bit of reality. You know, over the course of this global pandemic, I've had the opportunity to probably watch, or shall I say even listen, uh, to more sermons and Bible studies than even I would normally do so in the regular course of life. And can I share with you something I find disturbing? And, and I want you to hear me clearly. I'm not, I'm not trying to run the proverbial bus over people, but I want to be honest with you. As I watch services, as I listen to Bible studies, can I tell you something that is very absent, at least in the preaching and the Bible teaching of our culture? Is nobody really wants to talk about hell much anymore. You say, hell, I, this is Easter. I thought this was a happy day. You know why Easter is so important? Because according to this passage, you and I are condemned to an eternity of hell if Jesus Christ did not raise from the dead. Why do you think Peter and John ran to the empty tomb? 
because they knew they were sinners. I mean, after all, just look at what they did and how they acted in the days prior to and in the day of the crucifixion. Why did they run to the empty tomb? Because they knew something that all of us need to grasp. That if you'll take an honest look at the spiritual mirror of our life, we deserve condemnation. We deserve, quote, hell. You know that Jesus actually talked about hell twice as much as he did heaven? Why is today so important? Why is the empty tomb so critical? Because if Jesus didn't raise from the dead, and if Jesus is not the Savior that he was prophesied to be, then we're in condemnation. What does it say here in verse 17? He didn't come to condemn us, but he came to save us. Let me share with you two very important things you need to know about this, quote, condemnation. The first is this. That what you and I commonly refer to as hell, the eternal punishment for our sins, was never established for you. In fact, in Matthew chapter 25, verse 41, when Jesus is instituting this great judgment, he says, to those on my right hand, everlasting life, to those on my left, the lake of fire prepared for the devil and his angels. That place of, of the eternal, place of rebellion of the devil and his angels unfortunately became the consequence of our rebellion not just in the garden of eden but every day since and so when we look at condemnation please hear me clearly this was never designed for us we fell into the trap of sin we gave in to temptation the second thing i want you to hear and hear me clearly is that what we know as hell condemnation is completely unavoidable in your life and that's why easter is so important if it were up to your good deeds I tell you to get out there and get after it. If it was up to a certain amount of a success that you could attain, I'd say sign up for the course. If it was up to the traditions of your family, I'd say start the family tree right now. But what is it up to or who is it up to? Jesus Christ. It is completely unavoidable or avoidable. What is he telling Nicodemus? You don't have to go. You can have eternal life. You can have everlasting life. You do not have to be condemned. If you'll allow me to summarize John chapter 3, you have a man that somewhat felt confident in his relationship with the Lord. He realized real quickly that his confidence was on shaky, shall we say, sandy ground. Jesus comes in and says, I love you so much that I'm going to go to the cross. I'm going to shed my blood for you. I'm going to raise from the dead three days later. And if you will allow my blood to be applied to your life, you will have everlasting, eternal life now i realize that in today's world the last few moments would be considered negative but you realize we can't have the celebration of resurrection sunday we can't have the celebration of what we refer to as easter without realizing what we're celebrating that we're celebrating that he did not come to condemn us which we rightfully deserve but to save us when jesus christ rose from the grave he made it possible for all of our sins to be forgiven our soul to be saved, and our destiny to be a place the Bible calls heaven versus a place the Bible calls hell. Well, maybe today you joined us as one of those curious folks. Or maybe you realized at some point that you were a little bit confused of what the Bible said versus what you've always been taught. I hope you're one of those who's convicted. I hope you're one of those who today says, you know what? I need to do this God's way, not so-and-so's way, or not my way, or this way, or that way. I hope you're that person today who's absolutely firmly convinced that Jesus Christ is the only means of your salvation. And I hope that you want to be converted from death unto life. Avoiding condemnation and the celebration of what we know as the heavens can be yours for all of eternity. If you're that person today, whether you're seated with your entire family or whether you're all alone, can I just encourage you to have a conversation with God? Now, normally in an environment where there's hundreds, if not thousands of people, I would say you don't have to have this out loud, but wherever you are today, you may want to have this conversation out loud. You may want to shout it to the woods that are behind your house. This conversation, we technically would call it prayer. This is the means of going from death to life. Not because you say a certain phrase or you repeat what I say, but because your heart is crying that you recognize that you are convicted of your sin and convinced that Jesus is the only answer. So maybe your conversation would go a little something like this. God, today, on this Resurrection Sunday, on this day that provides forgiveness and hope, I realize that I got a sin problem. And God, I realize I can't solve it myself. God, I understand I'll never be good enough. 
God, I understand there's nothing that I could ever do to somehow, some way, make my life right with you. But God, I believe today that Jesus Christ has accomplished that which I could never do. God, I believe that Jesus Christ loved me so much that he was born on my behalf. And God, I believe that Jesus Christ loved me so much, he lived a sinless life, rejecting every form of temptation for me. And God, I believe that he, when he went on that hill called Mount Calvary, and they put the thorns on his brow, and they put the nails in his hands and in his feet, he was taking the punishment for my sins. And God, I believe when he rose from the grave, he made it possible for my sins to be forgiven and my soul to be saved. God, today I don't understand all the issues and problems of life and how to fix them, but this thing I know, that Jesus Christ is the only answer to my sin problem. If you had that conversation with God today, if you cried out in your own words, we'd love to celebrate with you. In fact, the Bible says in Luke chapter 15 that when one person repents of their sin, all of the heavens and all the angels rejoice. Please do us an honor and a favor. Either call the phone number that we gave you previous, email us, text us, whatever it takes. We would love the privilege of having a conversation with you about how this day that changed everything in history changed your life today. As we wrap up our service and celebration of this Resurrection Sunday, there's probably no better or more fitting way than a piece from Handel's Messiah. We refer to it as the Hallelujah Chorus. And normally as we gather with a large crowd on this Sunday, we stand to attention and we all begin to celebrate. The room is empty and so is the choir loft. So we're going to take you back to our Christmas rendition of Handel's Messiah just a little over a year ago. Allow this to be your benediction today. Join me in going back in time, thanks to technology, to Handel's Hallelujah Chorus. Thank you, and God bless. <laughs> 